um, that have applications for fire runs that would be applicable, for example. Um, I think they might even consider arguing and fire violence if it had to do really with fire violence in some way. Um, on the 12th of April, we have a faculty from the Hershey Medical Center coming up. There'll be two faculty that present during the, the time of the um, of our uh, Michael Center meetings, but then afterwards there's lunch, and then there's um, some activities for getting people to network together and to try to develop collaboration. Uh, postdocs, students, faculty, everyone invited, but you have to sign up. So look at your newsletter and please sign up. Tomorrow there is um, the How to Be Your Own Best Mentor workshop. It, it, who's taken that workshop before? Can you raise your hand? Yasna, I know you have. Yeah, so Yasna has. Uh, we've got a couple people who have. Um, so tomorrow from 10 to 1, again, you need to sign up. You need to sign up soon because of order group. So if you haven't signed up and want to go, please get off your phones and kind of apologize when you're asking to do it now. Because <laughs> um, I know Amy's going to be ordering right after lunch. So, um, and that's all I have. Go ahead. The third dog meeting today. Woo-hoo! Woo! Yeah. And where are you doing something for the cool stuff? Uh, so I'm going to go to Alpha University. If you don't know, dog is our mascot, right? It is now. It is now. Dog's our mascot. We got a mascot dog. But it's the data analysis working group, right? And it's a really great place to hone your skills for monthly mining. And not just looking at the dog. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Okay, so our speaker this week is Dr. Benjamin Wolf, and he comes to us from Tufts uh, University, where he's an assistant professor. Uh, Dr. Wolf did his undergraduate at Cornell University and a master's at the University of Guelph. And interestingly, we were graduate students there at the same time, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, then he went and did a PhD and postdoc at Harvard University. Or coming up. And so he does a lot of cool stuff on uh, microbial community assembly uh, in a lot of different systems, a lot of different food systems. We're going to hear about a totally different thing here today, which is cool. And um, but then also does a lot of interesting food and microbiome type research uh, activities as well. So with that, I will give it to Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come chat. Um, and as Gerald said, I'm going to be talking about something kind of completely different um, from what we do. It's a relatively new project. So I'm actually in the early phases of thinking about this and would love your feedback on this. Um, and I'm going to do the sort of obligatory slide that we probably all do when we study the microbiome. They're important and they're everywhere. Um, so I just sort of, this is how I frame all of my talks. And I'm sure all of you know this. Um, and what we're interested in my lab are some of these really big questions, big challenges in, in studying the microbiome. Um, and so one thing that we think a lot about is just what generates microbiome diversity, right? Why do different communities, why are they different in composition? And I really like um, one of these early studies of the human microbiome from Julie Segre's lab, uh, looking at the human body across different habitats. And you can see when you just look at these pie charts, the relative amounts of different types of bacteria across the human body vary from one place to another. And um, the question is why, right? Why do we see differences in community structure? And this is true in, in the human microbiome, but of course in, in many different systems. Uh, another sort of broad question that we're interested in in my lab is how do microbial parts or species interact with one another? Uh, and as many of you probably know, a lot of the history of microbiology has been monoculture. Right, studying bacterial or fungal or any kind of microbial species by themselves. But as we know from all of these microbiome sequencing data sets that microbes don't live by themselves. They live with other species and those other species can dramatically affect their biology. And so this is another really big sort of theme in the lab. Uh, and then finally, you know, we're a basic science lab. We're really interested in just the basic microbiology of, of microbiomes. But we are interested in this question of how can we manipulate microbiomes um, to benefit humans, right? We're often interested in the gut microbiome, for example. But of course, agriculture and, and sort of food microbiology, how can we use these principles of microbiomes to change the systems? 
Um, so again, this is just a broad overview of what we do in the lab, and I'm just sort of using this to sort of advertise what we do more generally, and I'll get to our really interesting worm study in a bit. Um, so the goal that we have is to understand the processes that control microbiome diversity. And what I do, I'm, I'm trained as an ecologist, so we tend to borrow a lot from plant and animal ecology when we think about this. So we think about um, things like dispersal, we think about microbial interactions, and we also think about evolution. Um, and as Daryl pointed out, the main systems that we study in the lab are fermented foods. I won't be talking about them today. I talked about them yesterday in food science. But that includes things like sauerkraut and kimchi. Um, that includes things like surface ripened cheeses. And it also includes uh, kombucha. Do we have any kombucha fans? Yeah, okay, good, great, yeah. Um, this weird slimy tea that is all the rage these days. Um, and we also study sourdough. And the reason that we study those systems they're relatively low diversity. There's about five to 20 species of bacteria or fungi in those systems. So they're really easy puzzles to take apart and put back together again. Um, the thing we learned from the fermented foods are applications. So we, we talk about how we can improve the quality of cheese. And this is what I talked about yesterday in food science. But the other thing we're doing, and this is what I'm gonna focus on in today's talk is translation, right? So it's fun to study food for the sake of food, but what can we learn in terms of general microbiome principles from these systems and take it to more complicated systems. Um, and that's what we've been doing with these planarian worms. Uh, this is the first time I've ever studied anything that crawls with eyes. So this has been an interesting challenge to go from these static delicious foods to worms, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and the other thing that um, I don't really have time to talk about today, but I talked about yesterday in a few times, is education. I think it's really important as all this microbiome science is emerging and the public is getting super curious and excited about microbiomes, to be able to sort of take that information and distill it in an accessible way, but also get rid of some of the misinformation that's out there. Um, and so what we do in the lab is we create opportunities both in our classroom, but also um, in the public to use fermented foods as a platform to educate the public about microbiomes. Um, so again, really quickly, just before I get to the worms, I just want to show you some of our other systems. So this is our fermented vegetable system. We're thinking a lot about how the farm microbiome and what you do when you grow plants translates down to the fermentation. So when you make sauerkraut or kimchi, you just chop up cabbage. You use the bacteria that are naturally in the phylosphere of that plant to do the fermentation. And we're really thinking a lot about how the farm microbial ecology can affect the ferment microbial ecology. And one thing I, I we're really proud of are our notobiotic cabbages. So these are these um, germ-free cabbages that we can inoculate and create specific synthetic communities on the leaves. And I'm happy to talk after uh, today's talk about that. Uh, the main system that we worked in the lab are these surface ripened cheeses. So things like telegio and camembert. And again, I talked yesterday in food science about how we bring those into the lab and these 96 well in vitro cheeses to think about microbial interactions. And, and we've done a lot of work in that space. Uh, more recently, we've been also doing some citizen science work with sourdough. So sourdough is another fermented food people make all over the world. And we've been part of this really cool project with Rob Dunn at NC State, where we had over 550 sourdough starters sent to our lab. We've been sequencing the fungi and the bacterial communities in those to understand patterns of diversity in the sourdough system. And then here's that slimy tea, right? So this is kombucha. You get this really fascinating biofilm of yeast and bacteria. And we're using this through an NSF funded project to think about microbial interactions and specificity of interactions. And what happens in this system is the yeast take sucrose in the sweet tea, they make ethanol, and then these acetic acid bacteria use the ethanol to make acetic acid and cellulose. So this giant blob in kombucha is mostly cellulose. So if you think of the plant thing, the bacteria can make as well. So again, that's the sort of primary stuff that we do in the lab. And again, that's the, these are the systems and, and the applications. Uh, so what happened is um, I was at Tufts for a couple of years and a neighboring lab um, had been working in the context of regeneration in animals. And they were like, you do all this cheese stuff, but do you want to play around with some animals with us and, and learn about the roles that microbes might play in regeneration? And so the, the sort of overall context of this work is a lot of animal microbiome work has really focused on the physiology, metabolism. So a lot of the work in the gut has been thinking about how does the gut microbiome help animals get uh, the nutri nutrients that they get, as well as immunity, right? There's been a lot of thinking about the training of our immune systems. And what we were interested in is there's actually very little work thinking about regeneration, right? So 
Um, we can regenerate tissue, for example, in our gut, but we're as animals, as uh, higher animals, not very good at regeneration. But a lot of animals can actually regenerate various parts of their bodies. Um, so here's some systems that have been studied for regeneration. I'll be talking about these planarian worms. So these are these really interesting flatworms that you can cut up into tons of little pieces, and they will grow a complete body again from in individual fragments. It's amazing that they do this. Um, there's another group of Megarians, they're called Hydra, and what you can do with the Hydra is a very similar thing, you cut them in half, and from individual fragments you'll be able to get a whole new Hydra again. Um, there are other animals that can't regenerate their entire body from fragments, but they can regrow particular limbs. So a classic example are various salamander species, if you cut off their legs or even parts of their tail, they can regenerate. Um, tadpoles, frog tadpoles can also grow new tails. And then higher animals do have the ability to regenerate certain parts. So a zebrafish heart, for example, has been studied. And even in mice, uh, liver tissues can very easily regenerate a complete liver from just a small fragment. So this is this, again, this phenomenon that has been studied for a long time in animals. And what we were beginning to think of um, as, as Mike Levin, who's been in charge of this work with the planaria is, what are microbes doing here, right? So all of these animals, are colonized by microbes, right? They have them in their guts, they have surface microbial communities, and could microbes be playing a role in either promoting or inhibiting this regeneration process? So if we sort of zoom in and think about it even in a little bit more detail, there's a lot of cellular mechanisms that are driving these regeneration processes. And again, because there are microbes hanging out near these animal cells, they may play a role in this process. So in the, the planarian system, uh, what happens is the planarian worms have a lot of stem cells throughout their entire body. So these are called neoblasts. And what those neoblasts can do, which again are scattered throughout their entire body, those neoblasts can help them regenerate all the different cell types that they need. So when you cut up a planarian worm, you end up getting the ability to regrow all those parts. You can regrow the eye, you can regrow the tail, all the parts that you need. The same thing is true with Hydra. It's a slightly different system in terms of how you regrow those parts. And so if you think about it, again, if you think about microbes colonizing these animals, they could be producing metabolites or interacting with these stem cells in a particular way that might drive the process of regeneration. And that's really what has motivated this work that we've been doing. Um, so what we've been thinking about are sort of a broad categories of the ways that microbes might affect regeneration. So, one way is that you might just get an infection, right? So you can imagine that if you cut off the limb of an animal or if you cut up a worm into many different fragments, you could just get a bacterium that's a pathogen. It infects the tissue and that tissue dies, right? That's a very simple case. Another case would be what we call non-pathogenic inhibitors. So these would be bacteria or other microbes that are living on these animals that produce metabolites that might inhibit regeneration, but the microbes themselves are not necessarily pathogens. And then finally, this is something that the regeneration community is really excited about, is this idea that there could be microbes out there secreting metabolites that could actually promote regeneration. They may do things like promote the formation of stem cells or even direct those stem cells to make particular types of tissues over time. So thinking about those sort of three different potential ways that regeneration um, could unfold with microbes, we've been focusing on these planarian worms. And they're really, or for me, jumping into an animal system, they're pretty cute uh, in the grand scheme of things. So these are uh, flatworms. They're quite small. They're about the size of a leech, but these do not suck blood, despite the way they look a lot like a leech, but these are not blood suckers. Um, and the overall sort of anatomy of a planarian worm is that they have these eye spots that look like little googly eyes that are really adorable, uh, that are connected to a brain. So they do have a relatively primitive brain. And they also have a huge gastrovascular tract. So this is what got me really excited about this at first. When you think about all this purple stuff here being gut, loaded with food and potentially with microbes, that's a huge biovolume of the worm that could have a microbiome that could be interacting with the worm. And then the way that these things uh, eat and get rid of waste is through one pipe, and that's the pharynx. So the pharynx is where food comes in as well as waste comes out of the worm. And that's sort of the overall um, sort of picture of the worm anatomy. Uh, the thing to note is that there is an anterior and posterior end to these worms. And when they're regenerating, they always know which end is which. They actually always know where to grow ahead 
and a row to go a tail. And again, they have this amazing ability to regenerate. So this is a sort of very simple experiment that we would do where you can chop off the head, chop off the tail, and you just use a sort of sterile knife or some kind of uh, scissors. And then over about seven days, you start to see the head and the tail regenerating. So here you can see the eye spots are starting to form about five days in, and eventually will look just like the original worm. And then the tail starts to form. And again, these things, these planarian worms have the ability to say, I need to make a head here, and I need to make a tail here. And all this is being driven by these stem cells that are distributed throughout their body. And these things have been studied for about 150 to 200 years. People have been playing around with these for a long period of time. So there's a lot known about how they regenerate and the ways you can change regeneration without thinking about microbes. Um, so you can cut them like I just showed you and get the head and tail. You can also cut them down the middle and you get the other side forming. You can cut a small fragment out from one part of the worm and that entire, that small fragment will grow an entire worm again. Um, you can actually take the head and the tail from two different worms, stick them together, and they will form a completely happy worm. They'll fuse together mm -hmm. to make a totally normal worm. The other interesting thing is that this entire process is dependent on food and nutrient availability. So if you stop giving the worms food over a long period of time, the whole worm shrinks down. It's all proportional in the way it shrinks. You get more food again, and it'll get much larger. And then there's been a lot of really great work, and this is where I think microbes can play a role, in how are the cells communicating to each other as these worms are regenerating? So how are the animal cells communicating? And so people have done things like uh, walk the gap junctions between cells, and that can dramatically change the way that the worms regenerate. Uh, there's been a lot of studies where if you walk gap junctions between the animal cells, they actually end up growing two heads instead of having a head and a tail down here suggesting that cell cell communication is really important. Okay, so what have we been doing? What have we been trying to think about? Well, the first thing is we first asked what bacteria are living on planarian worms? And when we started this work, there had been no studies of the microbiome of planarian worms, which shocked me given all the microbiome stuff that's been going on and that these have been studied for a long period of time. And there's a, another lab that's been working on this and they're finding some really cool results that I'll talk about. And I'll point out, we're working with the planarian worm Eugesia japonica. There are a couple of different species that people study in the lab, but this is the, the main thing that we've been studying. So once we've done the work to figure out what bacteria are just there, the second thing we ask is this really important question of, do these bacteria, do they affect the regeneration process? So that was the sort of second thing that we did. The third thing we've been trying to get at, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about today, is what are the mechanisms? How are these microbes affecting regeneration? What is the sort of chemical or genetic uh, mechanism underlying that? And then finally, what we've been trying to do is develop the planarian worm as a testing ground. So you can make lots and lots of these worms. You can get thousands of them, which is really great for things like genetic screens and then try to translate the host microbe interactions from the planarian worms to other animals that can regenerate. And I'll talk a little bit about our work with uh, frogs and with hydra as well. Okay, so for that first question, just what's living on planarian worms? So what we did is your classic 16S ribosomal RNA uh, sequencing that you've probably heard about a lot for many other systems. Um, we did some shotgun metagenomic sequencing as well to see if other microbes were present, and it's really just a bacterial community. There aren't any yeasts or other microbes present. And what we did is we sampled uh, multiple worms across multiple time points from this colony of worms that had been maintained at Tufts for a long period of time. And I should point out that these worms live in water. So when you grow them in the lab, you just add Poland Springs water, so spring water, and the thing that they eat in the lab is calf liver out in the environment when they're living in streams, they eat dead leaves and other dead stuff. But when we grow them in the lab, they really love calf liver. And so what we noticed uh, pretty early on is that there were a lot of different uh, proteobacteria as well as bacteroides that we found in sort of at the phylum level. And what you'll notice if you just look at the taxonomic composition, it's relatively consistent across worms, across individuals, at least in this sampling, and also across time. So we seem to have a sort of consistent set of microbes over and over again on these worms. It's not just a transient microbiome that might be related to the environment. And the nice thing, so, you know, we do a lot of work with these fermented foods where you can grow all the microbes. 
And the nice thing about these worms is they're actually very culturable. You can actually grow about 70% of the bacteria that we find on the worm, which is nice if you're trying to do manipulations. The other nice thing is that the colonies look quite different from each other. So they have different colony morphologies. So you can use culture-based techniques pretty well to track the microbiome in the system. And then if you're looking at some of these names, I know a lot of folks work with plant or soil systems, you might notice a lot of genera that you find in other types of environments, um, mostly aquatic or soil systems. So things like Chrysiobacterium, Pedobacter, these are widespread genera that you find in a lot of environmental microbiology surveys. Uh, the other nice thing about this system in terms of being sort of easy to work with is relatively low diversity. We don't have that many different taxa that we find here in the system. Okay, once we did our survey at Tufts and we found a relatively consistent bacterial community on these worms, uh, we started to ask, well, is this true across labs? So many different labs study this one species of worm. And what's cool for um, us is that we got our worms from a university in Japan at Tufts. And then Mike has had two postdocs go off and start their labs at the University of Minnesota and then University of California Merced. And so what we said is, what is the bacterial community of these different populations that have been separated from each other for a while and have slightly different management practices? And what we're seeing here, this is just an average of the data I showed you on the last slide for pups. And what we're looking at, again, is for three different worms from each of these different populations in these different labs you'll notice that composition is variable, right? So the relative amounts of different bacteria, so for example, this beta proteobacterium and this uh, bacterium called Aquatalia are really abundant in these two labs, but not as much in our lab colony. Um, so we are seeing a variation in the community composition, uh, but the nice thing is if you look closely, most of the things are actually found across the different labs, they're present, it's just the relative amounts are different. So we do think that there is sort of a consistent microbiome that you find in plenary worms, but the composition varies from one lab to another. The other thing that we've been thinking about in terms of the diversity of bacteria on these plenary worms is how is it distributed across the body plan of the worm, right? So I told you earlier, when we do these studies, we cut the tail off, we cut the head off, and we often will use the middle trunk fragment for regeneration. We thought, what if there's spatial structure across the worm that might maybe then translate into these regeneration experiments? And we found a lot of noise when we did this kind of work. Um, so what I'm showing you here is for six different worms, we're looking at the composition of the head, the trunk, and the tail. So we actually looked at the microbes just living in these particular regions across the worm. And you'll notice there isn't a particular signal for any bacterium in these different sites. There's a lot of variation both sort of across worms as well as across these different sites. So it doesn't seem like there's a head microbiome or a tail microbiome associated with the planarian worm. This may make sense. Um, they're living in water. They're swimming around in the water. It's a pretty well mixed system. They also have a lot of cilia on the bottom of their bodies that move water across their body plan. So it seems like it's a pretty well mixed system where you might get the microbiome mixing all the time. Another thing um, we tried to do for a really long time and then gave up on was dissect out the gut, right? I showed you that big gastrovascular tract. And unlike insects where you can often just pull out their guts and then sequence just the gut microbiome, these things, their guts just fall apart when we tried to do that. We tried all kinds of ways of dissecting it. But what we did do is we took the worms and we fractionated sort of the loosely associated surface microbiome of the worm and then we sort of pulled that off and then we mashed up the rest of the worm to look at what was really tightly associated with them. So we sort of fractionated the outside and the inside of the worm to see if any bacteria were enriched in particular places. And what was interesting is, uh, so Chrysiobacterium, for example, um, was enriched, so the relative abundance of it was much higher externally, so on the surface of the worm. And we found some bacteria, like uh, this Pedobacter or this Polaromonas, that were only found associated sort of internally on the inside of the worm. So it does suggest that there's some spatial stratification, some bacteria like the outside and some like the inside. And what I haven't told you is in addition to having these cilia, these worms are really slimy. They produce a mucus that is probably really delicious for bacteria to live on. And so for example, a Chrysiobacterium, which lives on the outside, may be using some of the mucins in that mucus as a, as a carbon source. Another thing that we thought about is, okay, these worms are swimming around in water. Where are they getting these microbes from, right? We saw that there is some variation across labs, 
uh, is it just that they're picking stuff up in the environment, right? They're eating stuff with that tube, they're pooping stuff back out. Maybe they're just picking up microbes that are loosely associated in the environment. And so what we did is we, we took a collection of exogenous bacteria. So bacteria that we didn't really find in their microbiome, but are found in soil and water environments. And we inoculated them heavily with these bacteria to say, can these exogenous bacteria, can they invade the planarian worm microbiome? Can they stick around? And we did this um, with a very well characterized E. coli strain that people use for studies of RNAi on these uh, particular worms. This is a sort of control. And then we also kept track of the endogenous bacteria as we did this. So we had a sort of pre inoculation, then we had um, control worms that weren't inoculated at all. And then we had worms that we inoculated with these exogenous microbes. And we can just look at the exogenous bacterial data. So not surprisingly, none of the things that are exogenous were present in our control worms. We didn't spike them in. But if you look here, uh, we're just looking at sort of whether we detected them or not. Uh, in the first couple of days, so day one and four, a lot of our exogenous bacteria were detected. But 15 days out, we didn't find any of those exogenous, exogenous bacteria. So when you try to invade a bunch of bacteria that you don't normally find in the planarian microbiome into these worms, they don't stick around. This suggests to us in the idea that we see a consistent microbiome over and over again, that these worms may be selecting for particular strains of bacteria, or there may be just some of these strains that are really good at colonizing the worms and others that aren't. So as we were sort of wrapping up this work, we got scooped a little bit, but in a really good way, we were excited to see this um, by another lab. And they've been working on planarian regeneration, but in a different species, it's relatively closely related to Dejizia japonica. And what was exciting to us is that they were finding very similar bacteria at the genus level and even at the species level to some of the things that we were finding in these completely different worms maintaining a different lab that are a different species. And again, it may be that um, some of these bacteria, like Chrysobacterium, which is really good at colonizing planarian worms, but it's nice to see some of these generalizable um, patterns across planaria. Okay, so what we've learned is that there's sort of a core set of soil and aquatic bacteria that we find living on planarian worms over time. But the cool stuff is, what are they doing, right? Are they playing a role in regeneration of these worms? So to do this, um, as many of you probably know, when you try to do these experiments um, to, to get, create a notobiotic system, it's really hard, right? It's really challenging. Um, and unfortunately, we've tried lots of different ways to sterilize planarian worms to completely make them germ-free. They don't really make like a true egg. They do make these things called cocoons, but they're not really good at growing uh, the propagules, the, the new planaria. And we did a bunch of experiments where we tried to completely wipe out the bacteria using antibiotics, and the worms died. They actually completely died every time we did that. So what we came up with was an antibiotic cocktail that didn't kill the worms, but dramatically reduced the bacterial load. So if you did a 16S PCR, we got no bands. Uh, occasionally, we'd see a colony or two coming out of these, but they were very low bacterial load worms. So then what we did is a sort of classic canary experiment. You cut off the tail, you cut off the head, and you use the trunk fragments for regeneration. So you then look over time at how these trunks grow a new head and grow a new tail. And we did this by inoculating those trunks with individual bacterial cultures. We looked at how individual bacteria that we found in the planarian microbiome affected the regeneration process. And what we looked at was the presence of eyes. So eye spots are sort of a classic thing that these things have to regrow. And we also looked at the overall body plan. So we looked at the length and width ratio of the worms, which tells you sort of how their overall patterning is unfolding. And so here's what we found. So what I'm showing you is uh, days post amputation. So starting at day three, all the way up to day 12. And we're looking at the percent of regenerating fragments, so those fragments that had eye spots. And what was really kind of interesting is that there were two bacterial treatments, uh, Aquatilia and Chrysiobacterium, that had a pretty um, important delay in the formation of eye spots, right? So all of these uh, worms and these treatments, it took them an extra day or two to get those eyes. So that was a slowing down of regeneration in the presence of certain bacteria. Uh, most of the bacterial treatments look just like the control. So the control is just water without bacteria added, so you can't really see most of the treatments. I think the important outliers are these two bacteria that slowed down the formation of the eyes. The other thing that we looked at, like I said, is the length-width ratio. So that, again, is 
how long the worm is versus how wide it is. And that's giving you an overall idea of how it's regenerating over time. And what I'm showing you, these are in different colors of the different treatments. This is our water control. And what each of the different bars represents is seven days post amputation and 12 days post amputation. So we're sort of seeing over time what's happening. And what you'll notice is that certain treatments dramatically delay the regeneration process. So you actually can see compared to the control, certain things like aquatilia really slow down the overall patterning of these worm bodies. And this is really cool because as I said, there's this other study um, on a different planarian worm and they found something very similar with uh, similar types of bacteria. So they were finding that as you try to regenerate these heads and tails, the regeneration process is dramatically delayed. Now, what's interesting about their study and, and different from ours is that many of the bacteria that they were working with caused pathogenic responses. So what was happening in those worms, they actually got these lesions. The worms were kind of like dissolving in the presence of their bacteria, but we don't see that in the presence of our planarian worm. So we don't really think it's a pathogenic process. We think that the bacteria aren't really infecting the worms, but they're somehow slowing down regeneration. But again, it's nice to see across these two planarian species, similar effects of bacteria. So what we didn't find was anything that promoted regeneration, right? We didn't find some bacteria that made the head grow super fast, which everyone was like, oh man, <laughs> we just saw the delay. But uh, I think that studying the things that delay regeneration, that's actually really important, right? If you wanna promote regeneration, you need to know what inhibits it, right? You need to get rid of maybe the things that inhibit it. So the next questions we asked were, okay, these bacteria that are slowing down regeneration of these worms, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And I'll be honest, this was kind of one of those science flukes where you just happen to be curious and uh, open to wandering down paths. Um, and it came from cheese. It actually came from the cheese stuff that we do in the lab. So what I noticed, so this bacterium aquatalia that can be really abundant on the worms, it smelled really bad, like really bad cheese. And I've experienced a lot of really bad cheese from some of our cheese work that we did. Um, and when I say really bad, it smells sort of like fecal, like a really nasty barn. Um, and that smell is something called indol. It's a, a compound that many bacteria can produce. There's been a lot of work on this in the gut microbiome. And the way you get indol is from breaking down tryptophan with an enzyme called tryptophanase. And indol is really stinky, but it's also a really important um, bacterial metabolite. Uh, people have found that indol can act as a proton ionophore. So it can actually change ion gradients in cells. A lot of this work has been done in E. coli. Um, and then in some mammalian work, people have found that the presence of indole in epithelial cells from uh, human tissue culture can uh, block the activity of ion channels. So this is work um, showing that bacteria that live in the gut can block, for example, potassium channels in these uh, tissues. And that can dramatically change the physiology of your gut. It can lead to inflammation or it can actually sometimes reduce inflammation. And the reason we were excited about this, the sort of like smelling the indole from this culture, and again, the aquatilia was one that delayed regeneration, is that there has been work in planarian worms showing that ion channels are really important for that regeneration process. Having cells talking to each other through these ion channels can help uh, figure out where the head needs to go and where the tail needs to go. So again, with this sort of random <laughs> observation of smelling bad cheese, we began to focus on aquatilia and thinking about indole as a metabolite that might be really important. And the first thing we did is we sequenced all the genomes that we had in our culture and we found that um, aquatilia has a tryptophanase gene, it has this thing called TNAA. Uh, and we also did some in vitro studies to see how much indole can be produced by these bacteria. So I'm showing you this is uh, indole production and what we're looking at are aquatilia and chrysobacteria. Remember, those are the two bacteria that delay regeneration. We have two bacteria that don't have the tryptophanase gene in their genomes and didn't really delay regeneration. And then we have E. coli, which is a very good indole producer, as well as an indole, or sorry, an E. coli mutant that has the TNAA gene a deleted from it. And so what you'll notice is E. coli is really great at making indole, um, but aquatilia, this bacterium that um, we were working with in delayed regeneration, can also make a significant amount of indole. And I say physiologically relevant here because in the gut and some of those studies, people have found that 500 micromolar is really important for affecting the animal tissues that it's, it's nearby. Okay, so knowing that this bacterium makes indol, we did some really basic studies. Um, the first thing we did is we did our regeneration assay 
in water or in the presence of 100 micromolar in milk. And what I'm showing you here, again, this is the sort of classic progression. This is a fragment that the head and tail have been cut off. And what you're seeing here is the blasphemous forming. Those are the regenerative tissues. You start to get the eyes and you start to get the head and the tail. And the presence of indol, you get none of that. So indol completely, the, just the pure compound, adding it to the water, completely blocks regeneration. You don't see any uh, regenerative tissues. And I'll point out that we don't really think indol is toxic here. These fragments can actually swim around. They're like totally fine. They're doing worm-like things. They just don't have a head and they don't have a tail. Um, so we don't think that the indole is, is toxic to the tissue. We think that it's just specifically blocking the tissue formation at these regenerative sites with the blastema. So to kind of better demonstrate the link between indole and aquatalia, uh, what we did is we played around with tryptophan concentrations in the system, right? So you get indole from tryptophan. So if you change the concentration of tryptophan, you change the concentration of indole. And I'll point out that we were not yet able to knock out the uh, tryptophanase gene in Aquatalia. We're, we're working on it. So this is kind of the indirect way that we uh, went about this. So uh, when you grow Aquatalia in um, the water, the worm water, and you add a pretty significant amount of tryptophan, you get really high amounts of indole over about four days of the amputation process. And this is just control. This is where we don't have Aquatalia present, but we're adding tryptophan in. And so what we look at is the worm phenotype. Um, so this is just in the regular and then with tryptophan. And you'll notice that tryptophan by itself does not affect the regenerative process of these worms. But when you add the extra tryptophan and you have the aquatilia present, look at this. These things are just are not regenerating at all. You don't get a head and you don't get a tail. And what we do is we, we end up having to take these fragments out of the treatment and put it in regular water, and eventually they do end up regenerating. So this indole is a really strong inhibitor of the regeneration process. Now, what was really cool as we were doing this work, um, there were some other things that were happening to these worms. And this is, this is the part where I think these planarian worms are just so goofy and cool. Um, some of them started making two heads. So this is what that looks like if you're looking at them crawling around. So there's a head, and there's a head <laughs> on both ends of some of these worms. It wasn't happening in all the worms, but across multiple experiments, this is our water control, and this is in the presence of indole, we got a pretty substantial fraction consistently of double-headed worms. Again, something being messed up as these things try to regenerate when indole is present. Um, and, and I'll point out, this is after, so they're exposed to indole, then we put them in water and let them fully regenerate, and they end up making these two heads. And the developmental and regenerative biologists got really excited, because this doesn't happen very often. You have to do some strange things to get these double-headed worms to form. And I'll point out that these double-headed worms actually have a brain. Um, so we can do synapsing to look at the brains in each of the heads. So this is that sort of side fragment. And these are the two heads and from different worms. And this green staining is showing you where those neural circuits are located inside the worms. And so they actually do have brains there. And then the other thing that was happening with these worms, uh, some of the indole treated worms are getting multiple eyes, this thing called ectopic eyes. You can see it down here, there's one set of googly eyes and there's another set of googly eyes. And this is happening across many different worms in these indole treatments. And again, you can do a various staining of these worms to see the eye spots and then the nerves around the eye spots. And they do have connections to the brain. They're not just extra eyes off by their own. These things have now extra sensory potential, which is really cool. So what we've been trying to figure out is what is indol doing to the animal host, right? What is these, the bacterial metabolite actually doing? So we've been trying to do some RNA-seq and this is fresh too. We just got this back last week. Um, so we, took the worms, exposed them to indole, and compared overall expression of the tissues of all the genes in the planarian genome in a water control, as well as when they're in the presence of indole. And this we did at two different time points. And what we've been finding, and we're still kind of digging into this data, is not surprisingly, you get a bunch of genes that are upregulated. Um, so that's one here in red, at the two different time points. And a bunch of genes that are downregulated. Um, but what's interesting, and again, we're still kind of going through this data set, is that some of the genes that we see that are differentially expressed are in the WINT pathway. So uh, the WINT pathway is a well-conserved pathway across animals that's important for telling things where to grow, where different tissues need to grow, and the orientation of those tissues. 
So we're finding that different genes in the Lint signaling pathway are being differentially expressed in the presence of indole. The other thing that I'll point out in a sort of microbiome context is that just the pure chemical indole, we're seeing differential expression of various innate immunity genes. So we're not actually changing the microbial exposure, we're just changing the indole. So we also think that this could be a sort of signal to the worms that uh, microbes are present. Okay, so we're excited about indole, it's just one potential mechanism. And we're still trying to figure out the exact concentrations that aquatilia is producing when it's living on the worm. We've been doing GCMS to figure that out and sort of dialing down some of our high concentrations to, to get to that. The other approach that we're taking is more from the bacterial side, right? This has mostly been the, the host side. Um, so what we've been doing is making transposon mutant libraries of the bacteria. So knocking out random genes throughout the genome of the bacteria and then using those mutants to screen against the worms to say, when we knock out a particular gene, do you see a change in the regeneration process? Um, this is all work being done by uh, Freddie Lee in the lab. He now has 3,000 mutants of aquatilia. And we've already been finding um, some mutants using a very simple assay to look for loss of indol production. So we're hitting some of those indol genes in aquatilia. Um, and we're gonna then be screening these mutants against the worms to try to see if particular bacterial mutants change that regeneration process to look beyond just indole with a sort of unbiased approach. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is just end with thinking about um, how what we're learning from the planarian system using this very reduced microbiome might be working in other animals. And we're part of the uh, Paul Allen Discovery Center at Puff. So this is Paul Allen, uh, the foundation gave a bunch of money to Mike's lab to collaborate across Tufts researcher uh, and other people in the Boston area. And fortunately, um, some nearby labs happen to study uh, Xenopus, which I mentioned earlier, can regrow its tail. And they've been recently starting to work with these uh, hydra, these kind of dairy that can also regenerate. And then Jessica Whited is a, a professor over at Harvard, and she studies these remarkably cute salamanders, these axolotls that are originally from Mexico, but are now often very popular in the aquarium trade. And they can also regrow a lot of parts of their bodies. So we've been trying to think about what we've been learning from the planarian system might translate to regeneration in these other systems. We focus on indole just because it's been easy to work with and we know that a lot of microbes can produce it. And one really exciting thing is we're finding that indole delays regeneration across animals, which is really cool. So what I'm showing you is an assay from a Xenopus system where we cut off the tadpole tail. And normally they regenerate a, a tail perfectly fine, um, but in the presence of indole, what we're starting to see is that the fins get sort of the same notch phenotype that we see in the planarian worm. So what I've outlined here in yellow is where the fin tissue is, and that this thing called a notochord, which is the tail. And we're finding that, again, in the presence of indole, we get this strong delay of regeneration. And this is something we can also do in the presence of microbes that make indole. So Adam's done this work um, with the wild type E. coli strain, and then E. coli with that tryptokinase gene knocked out. And we start to see, again, when it's making indole, the wild type delays regeneration, but the mutant that doesn't make indole, and when it's growing with these uh, regenerating tadpoles, does not inhibit the regeneration process. And the nice thing about these tadpoles, there's a lot more genetic tools compared to the planarian worms and ways to look at regeneration. So I've been doing things like looking at axon formation. This is an important uh, regenerative process in the, in the uh, tadpole system the formation of these axons at the site of damage. And so this is what it looks like. The axons are seen here in purple or brown. And you can see that there's a lot of them forming where this regenerating tail tip is. And what we've been noticing in a lot of the indole treated uh, tadpoles, there's a lot less dense axon formation at that regeneration site. So that may be one thing that indole is hitting. And then the other thing that we've been finding is that um, the sort of overall host response in terms of reactive oxygen species is, is different in the indole treated worms. So again, this is a control that's regenerating, and then this is an indole treated worm, or sorry, not worm, frog at this point. Um, and you may not be able to see it here with the lighting, but there's a lot more red here compared to here. And this is the rock skin. This is actually looking at recruiting these um, oxidative damage responses at the site of repair. And um, that's an important part of the regeneration process that we think indole is also inhibiting. And then Adam's been doing this work in a hydra as well. So indole also delays hydra regeneration. So they're really hard to photograph because they're just like these little amorphous blobs that go in all kinds of directions. But um, here we have control uh, hydra that had been cut and are now regenerating. 
And then in the presence of indole, you'll notice we cut these and they grow these new tentacles. You'll notice that they're not forming tentacles. And actually, in, in the higher concentration, they're having a really hard time growing at all. So this, again, suggests that this bacterial metabolite can broadly delay the regeneration process in animals. Um, so that's where we're at. We're kind of moving forward and trying to better understand the mechanism and thinking about other microbes. Another thing we're working on right now is going out in the environment, isolating a ton of different bacteria, inoculating them on the planaria to see if we can find bacteria out in the environment that might even promote regeneration, using them as a screening tool um, to move forward in this. And thinking about this in sort of the long term, um, you know, one thing that the, um, the biologists that we work with that are thinking about development they want to be able to engineer bacteria at particular tissues to change the process of regeneration. And understanding sort of how these microbes are playing a role in regeneration might allow us to do that. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to promote regeneration, you need to know what inhibits regeneration. So again, I think understanding these bacteria that can slow down the process is really important. And then the, this whole project really started when Mike came to me and said, we've been doing a lot of these planarian worm experiments. And there's a surprising amount of variability that we cannot control. We make sure the water is consistent. We make sure the way we cut them is consistent. Is it the microbes? And so one thing that we've been thinking about is, you know, if you have a lot of aquatalia present as you're working with your worms in one lab, that might change the way that these things regenerate. And might explain, the microbiome may explain some of these variable outcomes of regeneration. Great, so again, this is sort of a, a new project and I'd love to hear any ideas you may have about what we've been doing. And again, I'm just starting to work with animals. So anything you may know about animals would be really helpful. I'll thank Mike Levin, who has been funded by the Paul Allen Conspiracy Group um, to start the Allen Discovery at Center at Tufts. And then we've got a lot of help from the worm people in Mike's lab about how to care for these worms and how to feed them. There's this really um, gruesome day where we bring in calf livers and have to like blend it up in the, looks like a scene from Dexter in our cold room when they're doing that. And these folks are the ones that really do all the preparation for that. So. I thank them a lot for, for all that hard work and thank you for listening. Yeah. So um, I realized that you're trying to keep your culture as down as possible. Do you see fungi and viruses at all? So we looked, so my background is uh, in mycology. And so I was really hoping that we'd find some yeast or some other eukaryotic microbes. And it's really a bacterial world on these worms. Um, so we've done a whole shotgun metagenomic sequencing to get at this question of other microbes besides just looking at the 16S. And there's no signature of any dominant eukaryotic microbes or any fungi. There is a lab that has been inoculating Canada albicans on these worms to sort of develop them as a model for understanding Canada animal interactions. And the worms are surprisingly okay with the Canada on them. Um, so that's been kind of interesting, but we don't see any sort of endogenous yeast. The virus question is a really good one. Um, we haven't really looked carefully at viruses. We do know that there are some bacteriophage in the genomes, uh, so prophage in the genomes of these bacteria. And one thing we have been doing is thinking a little bit more about what is the microbial ecology of the system, right? How are some of these bacteria interacting? And we have found that there's a pseudomonas that grows in these worms that's very antibacterial. It kills off other bacteria in the system. But we haven't really, the funding is more for the host side of things. So we haven't been able to do the fun sort of microbial ecology beyond the limited 16S sequencing. But there's a lot more to do there. Yeah. How about the environment? So this is another really important question. You know, how well does the microbiome of these lab worms that have been in the lab for a long time reflect what's out in the environment? And I've really wanted to get <laughs> the Paul Allen Center to give me money to go to Japan where these things were originally isolated and do a cool survey there, but I haven't convinced them yet. Um, but this other group that's working on the S Mediterranean genome or um, microbiome, they did go to, I think it's like the coasts of Corsica or some other beautiful and interesting place where these worms live. And they looked at um, wild worms that they just pulled in from the environment. There was a lot of overlap with the lab populations. Uh, one thing that was interesting is they found um, lactic acid bacteria, sort of like, you know, our probiotic bacteria on some of these wild worms. But in general, um, they found that the things that are in the lab do reflect things you can find on the wild worms. Yeah. 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 Um, are these worms at all available in commercial labs, like Ward uh, lab supplies? Yeah. 
Yeah, so wards, and I think even Carolina Biological sells them for high schools. So th these are really fun to use with students, you know, thinking about something growing a new head is very fascinating. Um, and so we thought about um, using that sort of like all the people that have gotten those worms to see how the microbiome might change in those different environments. Um, but we haven't really been able to do that yet. I think it'd be really cool. One thing I'll point out is from a methods perspective, we had a really hard time doing amplicon sequencing or any metagenomics on these worms because there's a lot of host tissue there. And we've tried all of these sort of microbe enriched kits that are supposed to get rid of the host and they don't work for these worms for some reason. Um, so we struggle for a while just to like get the sequencing to work. Um, so if any of you have actually struggled with that as well, we'd love to talk. Um, at the end of the day, we had to do some sort of old school techniques in terms of DNA extraction um, and other sort of more difficult physical separation techniques to, to get at the bacteria. But yeah, that was, that was a big, it's like a year of our lives just trying to figure out how to get microbiome data from these worms. And the, the other people that worked on the other worms said the same thing in their paper, which we should have, should have been a warning signal to us. <laughs> Maybe why they haven't been studied for a long time. Yeah. Ed. So, Indel was also an important signaling molecule for bacteria. Yes. Have you, do you know whether supplementing with Indel changes the microbiome? Yeah. So, we have an undergrad right now that um, is sort of like doing all this microbial ecology work that we're not really supposed to be doing for this project, but I, I want to know, right? I want to know what's happening. Another question is like, why is Aquatilia making all this indole? Is it just a sort of waste product? Um, and what is it doing for its own biology? Um, so we don't know yet, but we're gonna do some biofilm assays. We're gonna look at motility, because Aquatilia is motile, and see if you know, adding in the indole, in addition to affecting the host, could be shifting the microbiome at the same time. Uh, but yeah, that stuff is just beginning in, in the system. Yeah. And kind of speaking to something you brought up yesterday, the cheese microbiome, you you have you looked at any in um you know screen level differences? You know, in the bacteria and you know, between different colonies and like that, or is it still we should really do that? Yeah, that's on our list of the stuff we want to do, but <laughs> we need to focus on the host. Um so we've been sneaking in some of that. Um so one thing we've done is we have cultures from all these different labs of the same bacterium. So one question is, you know, how could it evolve over time? Um, and using a whole genome sequencing to look at that. But yeah, so if anyone's interested in that, <laughs> um, it'd be really cool to do that. Yeah. So have you looked at other chemicals that are either have similar properties to indole, mm. or, you know, just to see, like, kind of narrow down on what are the chemical features of it that are actually. Yeah. So I don't have it in this slide deck, but we did look at different types. So there's many indole derivatives, right? Indole can become many different things. And what's interesting about that is they have um, different ionophoric activities, right? So they can actually affect these ion gradients across cells depending on the indole derivative. And so we took um, indole acetic acid, which is less ionophoric. And then we took some other indole derivatives that should actually cause steeper differences in ion gradients or, or maybe even block the channels more. And we do see differences in the regeneration outcomes. So IAA didn't really have a strong effect on the head regeneration. But some of these um, so five floral in five fluoroindole, which are five FA fluoroindole, which is a strong ionophore, dramatically inhibited, and even more so than just pure indole. So it does seem like some kind of uh, something to do with the chemical structure and their potential blocking of ion channels may help explain the the, the differences. And, and the serotonin? So they do, and we thought a lot about how tryptophan could be interacting or indole in general could be interacting with that pathway. Uh, what's interesting is in our RNA-seq, we don't really see a lot of differential expression in the hosts and serotonin pathways. Uh, we also don't really see differences in ion channels, actually, which was sort of surprising. But I'll point out our RNA-seq was from whole fragments that were regenerating. We didn't just dissect off the tissue that's regenerating at the tips. So we're kind of getting like the whole expression pattern. And so what we're going to do is do the RNA-seq again but on just the tissue, just the tip where it's regenerating, we might get a stronger signal if we redo that. But yeah, we're still kind of figuring out what indole's doing to the hosts. We haven't really nailed that down yet. Yeah, Josephine. Um, about the, the indole, I mean, you look at the 
Yeah. So, so in terms of the worm side of things, yeah, we also do notice that indol does seem to make the regenerating fragments darker in pigment. Um, you probably saw that in the pictures, and I've been I've sort of been surprised by that. And so we think there may be some interaction with melanin pathways um, that these worms have. Uh, we don't know, again, that didn't come up in the RNA-seq, so we haven't really been able to figure that out. Um, but it's something that is, is actually linked to regeneration processes. The pigmentation in melanin is sometimes connected to growing new parts of your body in these worms. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that we've been seeing. But really, like I said, we're really, this is like a two-year-old project that we're sort of just kind of playing around saying, let's get this thing going and what can we learn? And the, the, the future is bright, maybe. <laughs> maybe not for the worms that don't grow new heads, but <laughs> um, I think there's a, a lot that we can learn from this, yeah. <laughs> yeah? So when they're growing slower, do they actually regenerate fine? That's just a slower growth. Um, yeah, so that length width ratio kind of captures that. And, you know, one thing we have been thinking about is a lot of the plant microbe literature talks about this is competition between microbes and the host for resources. So um, in addition to microbes secreting metabolites into this water environment that could affect regeneration, they could also be taking resources away from that environment. And that may explain, it may just be sort of lack of resources that could be changing that. Um, so we're trying to, we've really just zoomed in on Aquatillian indol because it was an easy and interesting thing to chase. But I think, again, there could be other more resource model based approaches to think about this. Yeah. And, you know, another question is like, how dense is the microbial population that these worms would experience in streams and lakes where they live versus what we're doing in the lab? And we don't know. We haven't, again, been able to do that sampling. But we, we did try to dial our microbial densities to the same level as this other group that's been working on it. Um, it may be a little bit higher than worms swimming around in a sort of low nutrient stream. But again, just to sort of see what could happen, we, we kind of use these mid-range levels of densities of the bacteria. Yeah? If you fed the worms different things, did you get different bacterial effects on their regeneration? So here's what's really interesting about, and I, I glossed over this, about all this planarian regeneration work, is they starve the worms for two weeks before they do regeneration experiments. And the reason I've asked lots of people, it's one of these things you do it in a scientific field and no one knows why. But apparently the reason for this is that if you feed the worms a lot right before you do the cutting, they actually can get invaded by bacteria. They've actually seen that the worms will die. So maybe it could be, maybe if there's a lot of the calf liver around, which has a lot of tryptophan in it, actually we've measured that, um, you could have a ton of indol that just screws up your experiments. It may not be infection per se, but it could be something like what we've been seeing. Um, so I've been trying to talk to more people about like, do they think this is the explanation for it? But they're usually starved two weeks so that the whole body, the gut contents are often empty or very low in density uh, in terms of food, in terms of calf liver. There's probably still tons of microbes in there. Yeah. Yeah? Can I make a comment? Sure, absolutely. Done, Great. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and part of it is all the stuff we've learned from fermented foods, all the sequencing and culturing and sort of that thinking and more ecological thinking, we just sort of stuck it onto these worms. Um, and they've been really easy to work with, except for that getting the microbiome data. So, so thank you. Yeah, that's great. And if anyone wants to work on this, if you want to use it in any way, we're happy to share what we've learned and share the culture, share the worms. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, you guys. That's great. Thanks.